Okay, everyone, so this is the second of the bot lectures, and Maggie Miller is going to tell us about fiber knots and slice versus ribbon conjecture. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I think I scared off like half the audience after Tuesday, so that's kind of exciting. Um, so last time, whoa, that's loud. Uh, on Tuesday, I talked about uh, this theorem of Kasson and Gordon um, for K, a fibered knot. Uh, which, remember, was a three-dimensional definition. The complement of K uh, is a total space of a vibration over S1. Um, then K is homotopy ribbon if and only if its monodromy extends over a handle body. And this homotopy ribbon, to remind everybody, uh, was that uh, K is homotopy ribbon if it is the boundary of a disk uh, embedded in a four-manifold that is a homotopy four-ball not necessarily the actual four ball, uh, with the property that we look at the fundamental group on the boundary of the disk complement, so S3 minus K, this surjects onto V minus D. Okay. Um, so this was like our algebraic notion of what it means to be a ribbon, so it makes sense uh, even if we're in a non-standard four ball. Okay. Um, and so then we talked about why this theorem was surprising uh, and how maybe it's related to the Poincaré conjecture. And you could use this to construct some homotopy four balls or homotopy S4s that may or may not be the standard one. Um, so I don't really have much else to say about that because I don't know if they're the standard one. <laughs> um, but so I wanted to talk about two things today, uh, which both have to do with, uh, well, this saying homotopy ribbon and not slice. So the, the main conjecture that I wanted to talk about today because I'm still like just advertising what are like the big problems in this area of four-dimensional topology, is the slice ribbon conjecture, which I pointedly did not write on the board last time. OK, and so this is a conjecture of uh, Fox. And I uh, should have looked up the year. It's like, it's like really old. It's like a really old conjecture. Um, OK. Uh, and uh, specifically, the conjecture says that a, every slice knot is ribbon. OK, so remember, we have this homotopy ribbon, which is some sort of intermediary thing between slice, means that our knot K just bounds any disk in the actual four ball, smooth, smoothly embedded, uh, and ribbon, which means that K is the boundary of a disk smoothly embedded in the actual four ball. And when we look at the radial height on the four ball, it restricts to the disk with no local maxima. OK, and so I'm going to draw the picture again because we are going to use it for something at some point. Um, but the, so this was our example. This is the, the canonical example of a ribbon knot. OK, so this is an example of a knot that's ribbon, uh, although non-trivial, uh, because we just constructed a ribbon disk bounded by this knot uh, by starting with an immersed disk. So a disk that intersects itself inside of S3, and it intersects itself in these two arcs. And then we just took two subregions of the disk that contained these intersections, and we pushed these subregions deeper in the fourth dimension so that we get a disk that's actually embedded in B4 um, because, well, it looks like there's an intersection here, but now we have this extra fourth dimension, like this sheet is deeper than the vertical sheet so they don't actually intersect in four-dimensional space. OK, so this was our ribbon knot from before. OK, um, so the first thing I wanted to point out is that it, uh, if this conjecture is false, which it definitely is, there's no reason to think this is true. I don't really get why this is a conjecture. It's definitely false. Um, but I have no idea how you would possibly prove that it's false um, because, well, not no idea, but it would be really hard to prove that it's false really hard in general to prove a knot uh, isn't ribbon uh, without also at the same time uh, proving it's not slice. So we have lots of classical obstructions to a knot being slice. And we have lots of modern obstructions to a knot being slice. But there are very few theorems in the literature which specifically say the word ribbon. OK, 
Okay? So this is one example of such a theorem. We see that um, if k f fiber not, we have this condition that implies k is or is not homotopy ribbon. Um, and it, it, it really, we have to say homotopy ribbon here. The proof of this theorem does not work if I say k slice. So in principle, we could use this theorem, like take a fiber knot, show that its monodromy doesn't extend, and we would know that that fiber knot isn't homotopy ribbon. But maybe it could still be slice. So I will say something about why that's hard in the second half of the talk. Um, but I wanted to start off by pointing out that it's still not the case that this theorem says ribbon, right? It says homotopy ribbon. We have this nested set of inclusions. OK, so now we're in the, oh, but I have another. See, I avoided the shadow this time. OK, well, now it's, that's fine. Um, in fact, yeah, there's just, there's no, there's no good solution to that. OK. We have that slice knots are potentially a very large set that is, is not all knots but certainly includes um, ribbon knots. So I have uh, ribbon knots. I write really big, so I'm writing really far away. OK, in order to be sliced, you have to be a ribbon. That's true. And the slice ribbon conjecture, um, just imagine there's no space here. The slice ribbon conjecture says that this inequality is just like, or this, this inclusion is just like trivial. It's actually equal to. That's a slice ribbon conjecture. Um, but we also have this second definition, homotopy ribbon. Um, and, and homotopy ribbon allows like a, an arbitrary homotopy four ball, but I could restrict to like, what if this is the actual four ball? And I'm considering the actual four ball but I'm allowing k to bound a disk where I just have this fundamental group um, condition. So I'll, I'll write that. Uh, this includes homotopy ribbon knots where there's specifically homotopy ribbon in B4. Okay? Um, so all of these knots are sliced because they have to bound a disk in the first place. Um, and this includes all ribbon knots because it includes all ribbon disks. And I see I still didn't write far enough. Um, because I've suggestively left uh, one more empty space here. Uh, so remember this was somehow our algebraic notion of, of, of ribbonness. Uh, that's like not a very meaningful statement, but I just mean we looked at a ribbon disk and so like what's, what's sort of the best statement we could say about the algebraic topology of its complement? We could say something about the fundamental group. So call that like algebraic ribbonness. Um, but I'm not very good at algebra. Uh, so maybe instead I want to look at the topology of its complement and get like a topology version of ribbonness. And this is going to be a condition that we will call knots that are handle ribbon. And specifically, I'll say in B4. Okay, so let me write the definition of this. And this needs to be motivated by looking at a, a ribbon disk, uh, which schematically, remember what a ribbon disk looks like? I have the four ball. Uh, I have a disk that is smoothly embedded so that when I look at this radial height, uh, which I called something, R, or H, or something. No, I just said no local max. Okay, R. Then it restricts to this disk with no local maxima. So I have some points that are deepest, closest to the center, but no points closest to the boundary, um, away from the boundary. Okay, um, so what this tells me, and I, and I mentioned this at the level of homotopy last time when I was talking about the whitehead asphericity conjecture. I said up to homotopy, the complement of this disk is a two complex. So what I actually mean by that, and, and uh, if, you've, if you've thought about handles, this is kind of a standard thing. If you've never heard of like a handle or thought about handles, that's okay, that's okay. Um, the complement uh, of a ribbon disk, okay, I'm gonna have to move this definition to the side, can always be decomposed as uh, first a four ball, which I want to think of as a thickened zero cell. I'm basically building a two complex, but I want it to be a manifold. So this is like sort of a zero cell. Uh, plus uh, a bunch of thickened one cells. So these are like one cells. Uh, plus a bunch of D2 cross D2s. 
So these are like thickened two cells. Um, and they're all attached appropriately as if I were really building a thick version of a, of a CW complex. So, okay, if you know handles, it's a zero handle, and one handles, and two handles. Okay. Um, so this tells me homotopy information, but this is also like a topology fact. This is really restrictive. It tells me a lot about the complement. Um, and, well, I, I can't talk about ribbonness in a general homotopy four ball because I don't have a favorite Morse function in a homotopy four ball. Uh, but I can talk about this kind of decomposition of the complement in like any manifold. That always makes sense. Um, so, uh, in general, definition, uh, we say that a not K is handle ribbon if uh, K bounds such a disk. It could be in a homotopy four ball, where V minus the neighborhood of D um, has this form. Uh, so I'm going to write this as no three handles. And if you don't know what that means, I just mean it's a thickened two complex. Okay, so something restrictive about the topology. Um, this notion is a little bit newer than homotopy ribbon. Homotopy ribbon, I think introduced by Gordon. Uh, 80s, maybe early 90s. Um, handle ribbon, uh, originally called strongly homotopy ribbon, uh, is studied by Cochran in the early uh, 2000s. I was about to say I forgot how to spell 2000, and I was like, that would sound, uh, of course. Um, anyway, uh, Cochran in the early 2000s, and, and he actually um, maybe would have he, he actually called it homotopy ribbon. It just actually wasn't homotopy ribbon, but it was just a more convenient notion for him. And then Jeff Meyer called it strongly homotopy ribbon. And then Alex Dupin thought that was confusing and gave it this name. Um, so I, I like this because it sort of captures that it's, we're measuring ribbonness in terms of handles, which are these pieces of the complement. Okay. So if we look at this set of inclusions, the uh, slice ribbon conjecture says that all of these inclusions are equality. Right? So in order to disprove the slice ribbon conjecture, you just need to show one of these inclusions is not equality. I mean, it, it doesn't really matter which one, but in, in practice, if you're looking for a counterexample, the inclusion that you're looking at would really change which set of invariants you're considering. Okay? So um, in the current literature, I think not all, but like almost all papers that could produce uh, something that would distinguish between any of these sets, focus on this case. Most relevant results, I think, involve the distinction between slice and homotopy ribbon. And that's the case for this Cass and Gordon paper, right? We see that homotopy ribbon is the, the criteria here. In theory, we could use this to distinguish between homotopy ribbon and slice. There's no way we could use this theorem uh, to distinguish between like homotopy ribbon and ribbon. Because we're proving we're like we're gonna prove it's homotopy ribbon or not, but then once it's not homotopy ribbon, it's also not ribbon. Like we can't say anything. Um, there are very few conditions that deal with either one of these, especially the one in the middle. Um, I can think of something for links using the Jones polynomial uh, that sits in this intersection, uh, and maybe some like really, really random results. Like you could come up with some diagrammatic thing that really uses ribbon, um, but, but nothing that's like, I don't know, sort of major in the field comes immediately to mind. I could be like forgetting a result. Uh, so it's kind of an open question like, could you just come up with, and this is a little bit vague, but like a good obstruction, potentially, to a not, um, well, being uh, ribbon without proving, could you prove a not isn't handle ribbon? Wait, could you prove a not isn't ribbon without proving that it isn't handle ribbon? Like, prove that this, uh, like, maybe is inequality. Just give any invariant that could sit here, or any invariant that could sit here. Or alternatively, try to prove that any of these are equalities, but that sounds way harder. All right. Um, so. A few years after I was thinking about this Cass and Gordon theorem, I actually wrote a paper with Alex Zupan that was about, uh, I guess, this middle condition, the difference between homotopy ribbon and handle ribbon. Um, so I have no idea if you could actually use this as a, uh, an obstruction. I think it would be really difficult. Um, but in principle, here's a theorem where it's really specific to handle ribbon. Um, 
I'm going to write like a gross statement, and then we'll see that it's, it's better than it seems. But you're going to be disappointed at first. <laughs> All right. So uh, theorem. So this is from 2020. Let's do fancy. So we're like slightly in the future from last time, and it was six years ago. Now it's only four years ago. We're catching up. Um, uh, we showed that if k is any knot, which I wish that wasn't so far away. Is it this one? No, it's this one. OK, there we go. Question mark. OK. If k is any knot, and um, it doesn't have to be fiber, just a knot, uh, and then, and, or I'll say then, uh, k is handle ribbon. If and only if, and this is the part that's going to be disappointing, um, but there exists some circular Morse function on the complement of K to S1. Um, the standard form for such a circular Morse function would be to only have index 1 and 2 critical points. I'll just say like no minima, no maxima. So it's just like a, a normal Morse function. Like, you know, S1 is covered by little r's. So it's, it's just Morse in each of those intervals. It doesn't really matter that it's to a circle. This is like a normal thing to do. Um, if there's a Morse function with no minima or maxima, and this particular Morse function extends over, uh, well, we write extends over handle bodies. It extends over B4 minus uh, some disk bounded by k. In fact, I don't have to like, specifically say this. Just if it extends, this will be the form of what it extends over um, with only index two critical points in the interior and with the regular fibers being handle bodies. OK, so that seems really bad. Like, I'm the first to say that. Uh, it is a very restrictive form of extension. And it is interesting to note that, in fact, here, um, we're saying that we can construct one. Uh, but in fact, we can actually choose this disk. I could have said if k is any knot bounding a handle ribbon d, then instead of saying if and only if, I'll just say there exists a Morse function that extends over that specific disk complement. Okay? So let's compare this to the Cass and Gordon theorem. In Cass and Gordon, we have fixed boundary data. We have a knot K, and we have a vibration of the knot complement. That's the same thing as a Morse function to the circle. It just doesn't have any critical points. Um, that's what it means to be a vibration. Okay? Um, and then Cass and Gordon say there is some disk where, uh, in fact, this particular boundary data extends. But they can't control what the disk is, right? Here we have the opposite situation, where actually, I, I can actually control what the disk is. I can make it be, if I happen to know K is handle ribbon and bounds a handle ribbon disk in actual B4 even, I can fix this particular disk. But then the cost is, there just exists a Morse function on the boundary. Like, I don't know what it is. Even if k is fibered, like, and there is like a really nice circular Morse function, I don't know if I'm getting that one. I could get like a really bad one. Um, so there's like a trade-off. Um, I would say I don't know which is worse, but clearly this is worse. Um, we could all admit that. Uh, but uh, I was, I don't know, I like that it's not specific to fibered knots. Um, in principle, I guess, if you had a knot and you understood these, uh, this family of Morse functions is actually like really nice, then maybe you could use this as a criterion for proving that uh, a particular knot um, isn't handle ribbon or a particular disk isn't handle ribbon, which is generally not obvious. Okay, So that's something. And even though this statement looks really bad, um, what we actually did, which looks much nicer, Whoa. Oh, another one. Wow. But what about? Oh, I was writing on the board back. Oh, well. It's gone now. <laughs> OK. 
here's what we actually proved, so it's okay. We don't need the old gross one. Um, theorem, oh, with Zupan, is that a not K is handle ribbon if and only if it admits, and I'll have to tell you what the definition of this, but then you'll like it, maybe, uh, an R link derivative. Okay, so you should, you should truly have just no idea what this means, I think. So let me tell you what a derivative is. I think this is kind of fun. Um, a derivative for a knot does not always exist, first of all, but sometimes it does. Uh, this is a collection uh, of knots, so a link. So this is a G component link that sits on a genus G ciphered surface for my knot. So I'll give you a canonical example again uh, on sigma G, such that, and I'll give you the example, and then we'll observe what are clearly the properties that I want. So here's an example of a derivative. Uh, here's a knot K. Uh, here is a genus 2 ciphered surface for my knot. Uh, so this is uh, three disks. I have these two yellow ones and a green one, which are banded together at each of these crossings. We could figure out the Euler characteristic. This is genus 2. Um, I need to find a genus 2 link, or sorry, a two-component link uh, sitting on the surface. Well, uh, here's one circle that sits on this surface. Um, I have pushed on my chuck down here. Here's another curve that sits on this surface. Uh, see how when they go through this twisted band, like if red is below, then it comes out on top. That's why I drew it like that. So these are two disjoint circles on the surface. Well, if I call this L, uh, I want the linking numbers of all components of L to be zero. So I want this red and blue circle to not actually link each other in three-dimensional space. And I want it to be the case that the framing, uh, which I'll say framing, on each component of L is also zero. So both of these things are true in this example. If we investigate this link, um, it's kind of mysterious what it looks like at these crossings maybe, but I could figure this out. Uh, I have red, and first it goes through this twist region here, and it's twisting to the left. So red goes over blue, and I have this middle part. And then coming in from the left, it twists the opposite direction, so red actually folds back over blue. Okay, so I have this link. It's an unlink. So clearly linking number zero, those components don't link each other. Um, and when I say framing, what I mean is on the surface, I need to keep track if I follow this red curve of how many times do I twist as I go around once. So starting from this point, when I go through this crossing here, I twist halfway around to the left. I could do like a 180 twist to the left hand. This is my right hand, but I'm doing it backwards. Um, but then I go through this crossing, which is the opposite way. Like I twist right, and that cancels out. So by the time I've gone halfway around, I actually haven't done any twisting at all. And then the same thing happens with the other half of the circle. I twist to the right, but then to the left. And it all cancels out, and altogether there's no twisting. So that's what the framing is. And that's true for the blue circle, too. So this is called a derivative. They don't always exist. It's a special thing. You might have heard of something called algebraic sliceness. It's the same thing. It's just a geometric definition. But we can use derivatives to do cool things. Um, for example, uh, if I go to my diagram of a ribbon, come on, come on, which one? Oh, that one. Of a ribbon uh, knot with a, this ribbon immersed disk, from this immersed disk, there's like a standard way of getting an embedded surface in S3 of positive genus. Uh, what I would do is wherever I have one of these intersections, uh, well, I'm just going to sort of delete a whole neighborhood of this intersection. If you know what cut and paste is, I'm doing cut and paste, but I'm not going to say that. That would be a lot. 
Uh, and instead, I'll take a surface where locally, where there was an intersection, I have four disks, sort of in a square, and they're all glued together at these four crossings by four bands. All right. And then away from those intersections, the surface looks exactly the same as it did before. So now there's not actually any intersection anymore. This is a nice embedded surface. But I decreased the Euler characteristic a lot. Uh, and in particular, for each one of these moves, I ended up adding one genus to the surface. So this is a genus 2 surface. Um, but because I know exactly what the surface looks like, where there was a ribbon intersection, I have this nice local model. I know that where there was this intersection, now there's this unknot that actually sits on the surface like that. So I just drew this yellow circle. Maybe near this intersection, here's another unknot. And these unknots are really far away from each other because they're, they're just really close to those intersections. So they definitely have linking number zero. And there's also g of them, where g is the genus. And because I have this local picture, I can check what is the framing on this knot. Well, I twist left, left, but then right, right. Like the total twisting cancels too. So they all have framing zero. So what I've drawn here is a derivative uh, for my ribbon link. But it's not just any derivative. It's a derivative where both of these components are unknots. And they're unlinked from each other, so together they are an unlink. So ribbon knot, if and only if, I'm just claiming this is if and only if it goes both ways. It admits a derivative that is an unlink. So I, I actually just proved one way. I showed you that if it is a ribbon, then it admits an unlinked derivative. But going backwards is actually really easy. So now let's just say I started off with this picture. right? I have my genus whatever, genus 2 surface with my two component unlink on it. What I could do is take this positive genus surface, and I'm going to compress it along disks bounded by this unlink into B4. And if I do, I'll get an embedded disk in B4, and that's my ribbon disk. I'm not going to write that down. It's not super important. It's just that this is an equivalence. Okay. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy to prove. So compare this to uh, K is ribbon. If and only if uh, K admits an unlinked derivative. And well, here's a conjecture of Kaufman. And I do know what year this was, 1982. So I've been open for like a little while. Uh, this, this long time. Which is that k is slice. If and only if k admits a slice derivative. Uh. So if this were true, I mean, I know it's a little self-referential, but it would give us an idea for how to search for slice disks for a knot. You might have a particular knot, and the knot is very complicated. But maybe you understand the space of Seifert surfaces for the knot. It might be easier to think about links on the Seifert surface and try to prove that it doesn't have a slice derivative. It would just give us a new perspective on understanding sliceness of knots. Um, and there's a lot of like partial results uh, showing that oh, if this is true, then like these, all these like. It, the, like, it doesn't work on like really nice ciphered surfaces. You have to do something like complicated. But as far as we know, this is possible. Um, so this is kind of interesting because this ribbon unlinked derivative is like this is like a three-dimensional characterization of what it means to be ribbon. Um, it's this is a little bit four-dimensional here. If I say slice derivative, of course, that's a little four-dimensional. But it would still be a statement about Seifert surfaces and curves on Seifert surfaces. So like slightly three-dimensional as a characterization of sliceness. And then I haven't told you what R link means, uh, but it means that if I do what's called zero surgery, uh, I won't really emphasize this, but a certain kind of surgery operation on the link then I get like a certain three manifold. OK, so it's honestly, it's not even really important what this means. Uh, it's just that it's a purely three-dimensional definition. Whether or not a link is an R link does not involve four-dimensional topology. Okay, So we proved that this four-dimensional thing is equivalent to this three-dimensional thing. 
um, which is kind of like an intermediary step between something that's easy and something that seems really, really hard. <laughs> All right. Question? Yeah. Well, and, well, oh, you, well, it's, what do you mean? Like, the, the word slice? oh, yeah, when I say a derivative of a slice, I mean, the derivative is itself a link in S3, so bounding a disjoint collection of disks in B4. So that's what I meant. It's slightly self-referential because then each of those links, components, would themselves have slice derivatives, so you'd get some, like, tower thing. So I, I, I think it's, it's interesting if you're interested in, like, lower central series of not complements or something like that. Yeah. Okay, um, so this was the, the first thing I wanted to tell you about just slice ribbon conjecture and intermediary conditions and sort of where we are with potential uh, obstructions. But now I, I really do want to talk about the Cass and Gordon one because that's kind of like the best one. Um, so that's the good statement, which really does follow from this like bad statement that is hidden behind the board. We don't care about this anymore. That was bad, but it got us this like three dimensional thing. Uh, this is going to be in my way. Okay. So, let's use this Cass and Gordon theorem, or talk about how you would try to use it. So, uh, first, I'm going to I'm going to prove like this is not a good theorem. Okay, I'm going to prove something. Uh, so, claim uh, the figure eight not is not a ribbon. It's not homotopy ribbon, even. Okay. Um, so this is not a good theorem, because the figure eight knot is not slice. And it's, it's pretty easy to prove the figure eight knot is not slice. Um, the Alexander polynomial can be used to obstruct sliceness of knots. Uh, there's something called the Fox-Milner condition. Doesn't matter. But uh, basically, if, if you're a grad student and you're learning anything about knots or sliceness of knots, then literally the first example you see is the trefoil. But the second one you see is the figure eight knot. So if you're interested in it at all, like, you would immediately know that it's not slice. So you should not be impressed by this. But pretend that I didn't tell you that, OK? Um, so we're going to prove that this isn't homotopy ribbon. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use this theorem, because the, the good thing about the figure eight knot is that it's fibered. Um, so uh, there's two ways of telling that this is fibered. Um, well, they're kind of the same way. The first is to just like, re, like, like have a lot of practice. Um, so here's a Seifert surface for the figure eight knot, and I'll draw a different picture of it. Right now, this is so far an annulus in yellow. It has a whole twist. Somehow I haven't done anything up here at all. And then I'm going to glue uh, another disc that's blue. It's sitting in front of that yellow piece, and I've glued them in two places here where there's these two crossings. Um, so I could draw another perspective of the surface that would be easier to visualize if you haven't tried this before. Um, it's something like uh, this. It's Uh, there we go. No. Uh, so I just claim that this is, again, the figure eight knot. You could check that yourself if you haven't seen it before. It's not very hard to do the isotopy. Um, but this drawing of it makes it way more clear that it bounds a ciphered surface. Because I sort of have this disk at the bottom and then these two twisted bands that are glued to it. Okay. Um, and then if we know anything about fibered knots, this kind of picture makes it clear that not only is our knot fibered with a genus one fiber, um, but we can even read off the monodromy from this kind of diagram. Uh, because this is two twisted bands glued together, I take the cores of these twisted bands. So abstractly, on I'm going to erase our Cass and Gordon theorem. We're just going to have to remember that it's true. Chalk is in the way. Abstractly, I have a genus one surface with boundary, and I have these two curves that intersect in a point. And from this, um, I would read off, OK, the monodromy is a twist about each of these curves, and the direction of the twist depends on the direction of these twists, which are one is right and one is left. So it's going to be right on red and left on blue. Um, but in practice, what you do is you go to knotinfo.org, and it has the monodromies of all fibered knots through 12 crossings just there. So that's a solved problem. <laughs> all right. Um, OK, so this is the monodromy of the figure eight knot. And remember, we want to think of the monodromy as an automorphism of a closed surface. 
And we want to say, OK, we're trying to show this isn't homotopy ribbon. We want to use that Cass and Gordon theorem. The way we're going to do that is show that this particular surface, automorphism, does not extend over a handle body. So claim this does not extend over a solid torus, because that would be the genus 1 handle body. OK. How do you show that a map on the torus doesn't extend over a solid torus? Um, well, if it extended to a solid torus, well, then in the solid torus, or on the boundary, I would have some curve that bounds a disk in the solid torus. And like this disk has to map to a disk after I apply the automorphism. Um, but, well, there's, there's only up to isotopy. There's only one disk in the solid torus. It's the, the same one, because uh, it has to be like this essential disk, um, which means up to isotopy, like this curve on the boundary has to be fixed. So like this is really restrictive, right? This is genus one is like the best case. Um, so this is something that I can check. Because in fact, forget isotopy. Like It's the same thing, but that means the homology class of this curve has to be fixed by phi. Right? That's really easy to check. I just have to figure out what this particular automorphism does to the first homology of my surface. And then I'll just check if there's like a class that's fixed or not. Okay. So let's, let's see, what, is, what does this automorphism do? When I said this is a right-handed twist along first red and then a left-handed twist along blue, what I mean is, well, I have this genus 1 surface. And first, I'm going to do a right-handed twist on red. So that means red stays exactly where it is. And really, these curves should be oriented. So I'm going to talk about homology. So right, red stays where it is. But anything that intersects red, like the blue curve, instead of just intersecting and going straight through, it first has to twist to the right. Okay, so blue, it looks exactly the same, but when I get close to red, I twist with like a right-handed twist first. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to do a left-handed twist along where blue used to be. Okay. So that means wherever anything intersects this twisting curve, which I've drawn in green here, Instead of going straight through the intersection, I first have to twist to the left around the green curve. It's called a Dane twist. So red looks something like, oops, almost the same, except when it gets close to this green curve, I have to twist around to the left. So like that. Okay, so it's an oriented curve. And blue also intersects green. So it looks the same away from the intersection, but then when I get close, I have to twist to the left. Okay. So that's that. This is this is what this is the monodromy of my fiber knot, the the closed version. I have this genus one surface. I've just told you what this automorphism does um, to each of these curves, and they generate H one. So now I can tell you what the map on H one is. So uh, this monodromy, this one in phi. Okay, what is phi on H1 uh, of T2? What is the induced map? Well, in terms of this basis, uh, which I guess I'll call like, you know, A and B, I almost wrote A in blue and B in red, that'd be weird. Okay, so what happened to A, this red curve? It went to a curve that it still went once around this A direction. But now it also goes backwards around the b direction, the longitude. It's like one sort of meridian, a, and one longitude. But it happens to be going the wrong way around. So something like a minus b. What happened to b? Uh, well, it went to a curve that goes uh, actually once in this meridian direction, although backwards. But then it also goes actually now twice in the original B direction. See, this curve is twisting like twice about the longitude altogether. So two. OK. So something like that. 
Yeah? So if this is supposed to have a fixed curve, then that means, well, this matrix times you know, some vector that describes the homology class that's fixed is, is, is equal to itself. OK? But then this tells me that, OK, we'll just write out these, these equations. x minus y is equal to x, so y is 0. That's the top row. And then we got minus x plus 2y is equal to y, but y is 0, so that means x is 0. So that's, that there's a zero vector. That's the only thing that's fixed. So there's no fixed curve. So the fiber not, the figure eight knot isn't ribbon. Okay. And if we didn't know that that wasn't sliced, that would be like really impressive. Um, but as it is, that is not interesting. Uh, but it almost is because like this is like a key observation in someone else's paper, uh, a paper by Miyazaki in 1994, who observed that. In fact, we can use this idea, this same computation, which was very easy for this particular knot and simi similar knots, to prove that a bigger family where it's, where it's harder are also not homotopy ribbon. So theorem uh, Miyazaki, 1994. Uh, I'm going to say something very specific. He proved a more general statement. Um, but he proved that uh, no uh, cable of the figure eight knot, like non-trivial cable of the figure eight knot, is homotopy ribbon. Okay, so there's there's like w one cable in particular that I'm going to talk about. There's really like a whole family that we care about. Uh, we really care about. The so observation of uh, what's his name? Oh yeah, Kawauchi. Uh, I don't remember what year this paper was, but um, before 1994, because uh, this is cited in the Miyazaki paper, uh, that if we take the figure eight knot, and I'm, I'm going to draw a picture of a cable in case you don't know what that means, but I take any even number, positive number uh, of the figure eight. Uh, is rationally slice, which means it's slice, but not into the actual four ball. It's sliced into a four manifold, which is, has the same rational homology uh, as, as the four ball. And in fact, he can say more specifically what the homology is. And, and both of these theorems are, are less specific than I'm making them sound. Um, Miyazaki was not writing about the figure eight knot in particular. He actually showed that for a certain kind of symmetry that I don't want to define, but it's called strongly negative invertible or something. Um, for a certain kind of symmetry, uh, if you have a knot with that symmetry and it's Alexander polynomials irreducible, then you get this statement about all the cables. So it's actually like a very general theorem, really cool result, happens to apply to the figure eight. Um, and this observation of Kawauchi is actually just about, again, knots with this particular kind of symmetry, which includes the figure eight. Figure eight is a very symmetric knot. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> yeah. OK. So um, here's, here's the cable. Cable means uh, I'm going to take this knot, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to do the 2n1 case, not the, the general cable. And I'm going to take 2n parallel copies of the knot. At first, we'll have 2n components. OK, so that's, that's two components. This is n equal to 1. But I, I could take like more and more parallel components. OK? Um, and then uh, I'm going to join all of these components into being a single knot by just cutting the strands here and adding one over strand that connects the rightmost copy to the leftmost copy, and then join all the others without crossing them over each other. So now this 2-1 cable is a knot, which sort of goes around the figure eight twice, um, but like has this half twist in it so that it's something connected. Does that make sense? OK, so this is called the 2-1 cable. Um, so it's, it's important that like it's not homotopy ribbon. Um, this sliceness into the rational homology ball means that a lot of our classical obstructions to sliceness will fail for this knot. It's like really hard to prove that this isn't slice. 
Um, I could say more about why it's really hard to prove that this knot isn't sliced. Uh, I mean, r roughly, it's, this knot kind of looks like two copies of the figure eight. And if you connect some two copies of the figure eight, that's actually sliced. That sounds like a really vague, naive thing to say. But that really is the problem. Um, this knot. It's, it's, it's double branched cover looks like it belongs to the double branched cover of a slice knot or surgery on a slice knot, which again um, encapsulates like a lot of like the usual ways that we prove that a knot is not sliced. So really hard problem. And if you'd asked people maybe like three years ago, um, what is the best potential counterexample to the slice ribbon conjecture, I think some collection of people would have said this knot. Um, definitely Kawauchi would have said this not, because um, he asked about it specifically in this paper. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, depending on like how much of an optimist you are. Uh, wait. I guess I don't know why I exchanged those. I just felt like I should. There was this paper uh, two, two years ago. So theorem, uh, Dai, Kong, Malik, Park, Stauff again. And I, I want to address the elephant in this room because I did spell Song Kyung's name wrong in the abstract. So just in case he sees this, I know how to spell your name. My phone does not. OK? Um, it's an A. Great. So uh, Dai Kong Malik Park Stoff again, they showed that uh, this particular knot, 2-1 cable of the figure 8, is not slice. OK, and so they, they used, they used um, tools from floor, floor homology. Uh, they essentially, they looked at the double branched cover of S3 branched along this knot. Uh, and the double branched cover as a manifold, we can't exactly use that to prove that the knot isn't slice. But it's a double branched cover, so it comes with an involution. And so they studied this manifold equipped with an involution and got some contradiction to this not being slice. All right. Um, but so th this, is, this is a really recent result. Um, they developed techniques that are used in this paper. Like this is using recent technology. Um, and again, uh, this paper was not specifically about this knot. They actually showed the two one cables of um, many knots. They have like some specific properties that need to be true. Uh, are not slice. Uh, so it's, it's a little technical to state the exact condition, but they're considering knots that admit the kind of symmetry I was talking for, and additionally are what's called floor thin, and I have R invariant one. I think that's the, like a bunch of things that are true about the figure eight knot. Okay. So um, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you this proof, but I am going to tell you an alternate proof. So go in the next 20 minutes is to give you an alternate proof um, and this is joint with uh, Paolo Aceto, let me think about that, uh, uh, Castro, Park and Stoffrigan. Not, not, it's not Stoffrigan, it's Dipschitz. It's just, it's the same part, which you think that's not, not really allowed. Okay. So this was the next year. And, and we didn't set out thinking about this particular result. Um, I mean, we should have, because we were at our aim square, which was supposed to be about this Cass and Gordon theorem. But we were like ignoring the rules entirely, because like, we just didn't have an idea about it. And so like, we were just thinking about whatever, like, oh my gosh. <laughs> we, were just <laughs> we were just thinking about whatever Andros told us to think about. Um, uh, and so uh, Andres Dipschitz was really interested in understanding, and this is going to sound super unrelated, um, but it's not. He was, he was interested in understanding what is the minimum genus Co question. So another open question, which we're getting more specific over time, but this is still a question that I think four-dimensional topologists care about. Uh, what is the minimum genus of a smooth surface in the four manifold uh, connect sum of two CP2s, representing uh, a given homology G class. So I'm going to write my homology class as like MN, because the second homology class, second homology of two CP2 is equal to just two copies of Z. 
Okay, and so the reason we're asking about 2CP2 is there's a very well known theorem of uh, Kronheimer and Rufka, trying not to make eye contact, uh, from like 1994, uh, that the minimum genus in CP2, uh, let's say d greater than 0, the min genus of this homology class, so it's a d in z, which is the second homology, is d minus 1 choose 2. So a really nice, easy formula. So if you had never thought about 2CP2, it would be extremely reasonable to guess that this is like the answer in 2CP2. So I think extremely reasonable to guess that the genus of the homology class MN should just be the sum. We have m minus 1 choose 2 plus n minus 1 choose 2. Um, that's fine. Unfortunately, that is like super not true. OK, so this is like m n greater than 0. Uh, and, and this is like really far from being true. Uh, there was a cool paper like two years ago, uh, Marco Marangon, uh, Allison Miller, not me, different Miller, no relation. Um, uh, uh, Arunima Ray, and again, Stipschitz. Uh, they were not giving the first examples where this isn't true, but they were exploring the limits of like how, how far from being true this is. Uh, and they showed that if m is bigger than 3n, then no, not the minimum genus. The, the, the minimum genus is, is lower than this bound. We can beat the naive guess. And as m gets a lot bigger than 3n, we can beat the naive guess by an arbitrarily large amount. So this is like an arbitrarily large, l arbitrarily large bad guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this, this m greater than 3n is kind of interesting, because like, I don't know about that equal to 3n case. Like, here's, here's a fact. Uh, this is a consequence of a theorem of Rucklin, just Rucklin's theorem, um, from the 1950s. Rucklin tells us that the genus of the homology class 3, 1, so right on this line, is equal to 1, which you might notice is secretly 2 choose 2 plus uh, 0 choose 2. Okay, so the naive guess is actually true for the homology class 3, 1. Um, so this is 1950s. And then significantly harder, 1990s, I think 1997, Brian, so this is like 50s, this is 90s, uh, showed that the genus of the homology class 6, 2, so still on this line, just like the next homology class, is equal to 10, um, which you might notice is uh, 5 choose 2 plus 1 choose 2. Okay? So the naive guess again works. Um, but now we have a problem because there's like a 40 gap, 40 year, year gap here. So we're not going to know about 93 for like, you know, 15 more years or something. Um, so uh, certainly Brian's argument fails uh, once we go to the next homology class. It's like an incremental improvement on known bounds. But since we're working with integers, every once in a while, an, an incremental improvement like passes some threshold and you prove something good, you know? But then we need, we need like another improvement on an idea in order to do better than this. Um, but once we know this is not true, or once we know this is true, and that, that we can't beat 10 in the homology class, um, here's like a weird theorem, okay? Uh, so I'm again going to prove that the figure eight not, is not a uh, slice. So let me erase my homotopy ribbon proof. We're just going to prove it's not sliced now, so that's redundant. And again, we're forgetting the Alexander polynomial exists. That would be easier. So claim, this knot is not smoothly sliced. OK? Um, well, here's the reason. I'm going to suppose that it is sliced, and I'm going to get a contradiction. All right? What I'm going to do is assume that it is sliced. And I'm going to start building a closed surface inside of 2CP2. 
So here's what 2CP2 looks like. You might remember from a first semester in algebraic topology that the complex projective plane is like the only thing that you compute the cohomology of, probably. Um, and it has, uh, it's built from a zero cell, a two cell, and a four cell. All right. So, um, well, what is 2CP2? Uh, it's built from a zero cell, which is a ball, thickens to be a ball. Okay, we have this S3 on the boundary. I attach uh, two two cells, um, but I, I've thickened them, so I'm thinking about these as this is my S3, maybe attached along two circles. Uh, and then somehow I now have to attach a four cell, which actually is a ball, uh, along an S3. Okay. Um, so if, well, there's, there's like this bell curve here where if you like really knew what I was talking about, I wouldn't draw this. I would just draw a Kirby diagram. And if you didn't know what CP2 was, I'd have to talk about the hop vibrations. So I'm just not going to do anything. Um, so it's, it's just this. Um, so what I'm going to do is start off with, in this S3 cross section, uh, I'm going to draw a figure eight knot. Okay, um, so let me temporarily erase my two thickened two cells. So I, I'm gonna draw my figure eight knot in like a really suggestive way. Uh, I'm gonna do some isotopy. Yes, okay. I, I, need, I need this to be bigger, I need this to be bigger. Okay, um, so I've just done a Reitermeister one move here and another Reitermeister one move here. Okay, so that's clearly still the figure eight, right? Like we're okay with that. I just sort of like added two curly cues. Um, maybe I like isotope this slightly for no reason. And I'll push this up. Great, okay, so that's the figure eight knot. I've just drawn it in such a way that it will be really easy for me to draw where I should attach those two cells along curves. Uh, Cause I wanna attach them along curves that link my knot in some complicated way. <sighs> okay, so what happens when I attach these two cells? Well, like really vaguely, because the four cell of a CP2 is glued to the two skeleton uh, using a hop vibration, it's a specific map from S3, which is the boundary of the four cell, to S2. Uh, what happens when I look at this boundary S3 in the four cell is that I see the exact same knot here, um, but wherever I've drawn these two green circles, I've added a full twist between the strands. Like I grabbed those three strands and I just twisted 360 degrees. Okay. So locally, each time I have one of these guys, I replace it with something like this. Okay. And so I'm not going to draw the manipulation to check. Honestly, like if this were like a topology seminar, I always do because people like it. It's like kind of fun. Um, but I, I don't know. I just, we don't have to do that. It's okay. Um, but <laughs> if, I, if I zoom in here and I actually do this move to this knot in these two places, I get a really big diagram of the unknot. Um, and this isn't a coincidence. There's a very common trick here that I've applied. Um, really, I saw that like, okay, I kind of wanted to like change some crossings of my knot. And well, there's a reason that we did these Reitermeister one moves. Whenever I have two strands and I like add a crossing and twist in this way, something like good happens. This didn't come out of nowhere. This came out of a long history of, of papers manipulating diagrams of knots. And particularly applied to the figure eight knot, um, this, is, this essentially appears in a paper by William Bollinger, uh, who, who was a grad student at Princeton at the time, um, who was studying a surprisingly small self-intersection, or small genus, large self-intersection surfaces in connectons of CP2s. Um, so this is like not a random picture. Um, but I end up building a surface well, I have this sort of annulus in the middle here. I've assumed that the figure eight knot is slice, which means in this bottom four ball, I could consider a slice disk for the figure eight. And at the top, I get an unknot, which is definitely slice. So in the four cell, I could consider a slice disk for the unknot. And altogether, I get a two sphere 
sitting inside of 2CP2. And the rule for how you read off what homology class a surface represents inside of a connexoma CP2s is you just count how many times it intersects the generators of homology, which means I'm going to count how many times it links these two circles that I used to do the twisting. So when I zoom in on my diagram here, well, I have to orient my knot in order to count how much it links something. And I can check this bottom circle. This particular knot links it three times. And each time, the strand is oriented pointing up. So it's really three, algebraically. I have this other circle where it looks like it's linking my knot three times, but if I follow my finger around this knot, I see two of those strands will have upwards facing arrows, but then I'll have this last time where I come down. So the linking number, actually two of those cancel out, and it's one. So what I've just constructed for you here is then there's a two-sphere inside of 2CP2 two representing the homology class 3, 1, which we know is impossible by this Rockleen theorem. OK, so that is a needlessly complicated proof that the figure 8 knot isn't slice. The Alexander polynomial would have been better. Um, but now we can do the same thing that uh, Miyazaki did. Miyazaki had this, like, you know, it's not that interesting to apply the Cass and Gordon theorem to the figure 8, but when you apply it to cables, suddenly it might be really interesting. So we could take this exact same construction and just take a cable of this whole two-sphere. Like, replace this complicated diagram of the figure eight with a similarly complicated diagram of the two-one cable of the figure eight. And I'm not going to try to like go through it. But if we do, what we actually get is similarly, if the two-one cable of the figure eight is slice, then a similar idea, we get a certain surface, which happens to be genus 9, conveniently. And it's specifically in the homology class. Well, it's going to be like this original homology class times however many times we cable. So if we take the 2, 1 cable, we get 2 times 3, 1. So class 6, 2. And, and this would contradict the Bryan theorem from the 1990s. So that's like another reason that the 2, 1 cable isn't sliced. And like, well, that's actually, that's actually nice. I mean, it's needlessly complicated for the figure 8, right? We didn't need to do this. But it's actually pretty hard to prove this knot's not sliced. And like, I guess if you don't like handle diagrams, this probably seems complicated. But if you do, then this is actually really easy. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll end with like some things that are, are open because I've been stating a lot of open problems. Um, so let me tell you first some comments. So first of all, it's still, it's still possible that this, even this Miyazaki construction could give us a counterexample to the slice ribbon conjecture. You just need to choose a different knot or a different cable. Okay? So the daikong malik clark stafferigan result does not apply to every knot that Miyazaki does. There's still room for two one cables to be the answer. Another observation is neither argument for the 2, 1 cable not being slice. Neither argument applies to the 2, n, 1 cable for n greater than 1. Um, in the case, it's easier for me to say what's wrong with this argument. Uh, it's because, well, to go from figure 8 to a cable, I had to understand, instead of the 3, 1 homology class, the 6, 2 homology class. As I take higher cables, I would need to understand the minimum genus of higher, like bigger homology classes in 2 CP2. So what we can say is, if the minimum genus of the you know, 3 times 2 n uh, 2n homology class uh, in H2 of 2CP2 is the naive, ge naive guess then the same argument applies. Uh, but then you'd have to prove this genus bound. Um, that is probably really hard. OK, so maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe they're, maybe they're just, there could be one that is slice, but probably not, I guess. Um, and also, both arguments 
are inherently smooth. Uh, the dicot malik park Stoffigan paper uses floor homology. Um, I have no idea how they would make that not a smooth argument. Uh, this paper, um, well, we're using smooth topology because we're citing this Brian result. I didn't tell you at all how Brian proves this. I mean, this is like, uh, this, this is gauge theory. This is all very smooth, and in fact, the result is not true if we don't say smooth. Um, it's a result of Lee and Wilzinski. Uh, 1990s, uh, 1994, I think, um, that there is actually a locally flat uh, genus 8 surface representing the homology class 6-2 in 2-CP2. So that just, it just doesn't, doesn't work locally flatly. I have no idea what you would do. Um, and I did, I did, I know I said like in the first talk, everything is smooth and Friedman doesn't exist, but like, I'm sorry, we're back. Um, it's one more, one more open question, uh, which is, no, no. I don't know why I find that so confusing. But last open question, which in principle, the uh, Cass and Gordon result could still help us answer. We just need like, other new techniques for proving things are slice. So question or conjecture, if a knot K is topologically slice, by which I mean it bounds a disk D, but now it's not smoothly embedded, it's just locally flat, locally flat into B4, then uh, is K or does K bound a homotopy ribbon locally flat disk in V4. So this is the topological version of the slice ribbon conjecture. I guess I phrased it as a question because I still don't think either one's true. Um, the uh, Cass and Gordon theorem doesn't really need smooth topology. It tells us again that this 2 1 cable or, or any other knot that's fibered and the monodromy doesn't extend is not homotopy ribbon even with a locally flat disk. But if that knot were topologically slice, bounding a locally flat disk into B4, then the answer to this would be no, and that would be like really good. <laughs> okay, so that was the correct amount of time. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop now. Thanks.